Hey everybody, I'm Chris Massey and welcome to the Chris Massey Music Show and tonight is episode one of season four and the 51st episode of the Chris Massey Music Show and I'm joined by my partner in crime as always, Mr. Al Burroughs. How are you doing? What's happening, boss? How are the holidays to you? I'm still full. Yeah, did you go out and do some work with the SOS band over the holidays? No, we're going to Europe in the end of this month. So. Wow, how long yeah. are you going to be over there? Four days. You going to tour with anybody? Uh, no, just just, just you guys. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, All right. Can't wait. Okay. Well, to start the new year off, Al, we've got a brand new sponsor. And uh, uh -huh. we do, and uh, we have to do, so we're going to go ahead and do a little spill for them uh, before, we, uh, before we get going. We'll put it right up here where everybody can see it. This is a new product. It's called Poo-Pourri. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> Poo-Pourri. Just two squirts of this in the toilet before you do your business. And when your friends say, hey, man, you think your shit don't stink. You're right. In fact, I know it don't stink because I use Poo-Pourri. That's right. Available at drugstores all over Metro Atlanta. And that's real. Okay. It is real. It's real. What's the one, the VI Poo? That's the other one that's on TV. Yeah. The VI Poo. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you have to do. I mean, that's a that Don, called, maybe Donald Trump has to use that. I don't know. What's wrong with eating right? <laughs> eating right makes it worse. Says that. <laughs> All right. Last night from Hollywood, they had the Golden Globes Award Ceremony. Al, did you get a chance to catch any of this? No, man, I missed that one. Okay. All right, one of the highlights of the evening was actress Meryl Streep was uh, given the Cecil D. DeMille uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. And during her acceptance speech, uh, she uh, said that something that really bothered her this year, that she was so disappointed that it made her heart sink, was when she saw someone go on national TV and make fun of a disabled person. She said that uh, people that rank higher than people with power and prestige doing something like this tells everybody that it's okay to do this. Now, she didn't mention who she was talking about. But we all know who it is now, now, don't we? Now. So, now, if I am a, what's Donald Trump's manager's name? I always forget. Oh, Kellyanne. Whatever. Kellyanne Carlson, right? Something like that. Yeah, now, Kellyanne, if she was doing her job, she should have called Donald Trump right away. And she said, look, Donald, here's what you need to say. You need to say, Meryl Streep is one of the finest actresses in our generation. Like every American, she has her right to free speech fact that she can exercise her First Amendment rights on national TV is one of the things that makes America great. Now, how hard was that? Yeah, that'd be smooth. That'd be smooth, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Instead, Donald Trump said this. Meryl Streep's one of the most overrated actresses in Hollywood. She's a Hillary Clinton flunky that lost big time. Is that what he said? That's what he tweeted. That is correct. Let me tell you, the maturity level of this man is the same as a six-year-old boy on the playground. When a child tells him he's got cooties, he yells back, yeah, but your cooties are bigger. <laughs> I mean, look, Donald Trump can't go bomb Meryl Streep's house. What's he going to do when a foreign leader says he's an idiot? And let me tell you something, that is within the realm of possibility. Yes. Or if he gets a uh, approval rating that is not favorable. How is Donald Trump going to react to that? I tell you, it's something we should all be a little concerned about. But, Mr. Trump, let me tell you something. You are wasting your time saying bad things about Meryl Streep or any artist, for that matter. Because all artists know this. One of the criteria for being an artist is you've got to have tough skin. And I can assure you everybody in Hollywood does, and you do not. No matter who you are, if you're a barroom singer like me or a big-time actress like Meryl Streep, somewhere along the line, somebody has not liked what you've done. And, they, and sometimes they tell you. Sometimes they write about it. Sometimes they talk about it on TV. Rolling Stone magazine trashed every album Led Zeppelin ever did. Did you know that? I didn't know that. They did. They sold 300 million records. <laughs> and I don't ever remember Peter Grant, their manager, getting on TV and saying, that guy from Rolling Stone is the most talentless journalist out there in the business. He don't know shit and he's a dumbass. You know why? Because they know it goes with the territory, like every artist does. It also goes for politics. And Donald Trump, you need to figure it out. You need to be trying to win these people over instead of making more and more enemies. Now, I found out about the tough skin thing very early in my career. When I was 18 years old, we had just done a show at the Agora Ballroom, 
And I bet you I had not played 10 live shows uh, on this night. I was up at the bar when the night was over, and this long-haired rock and roller who came to the Agora that night wanting to hear some rock and roll, instead it was punk rock and new wave it was going on, got right in my face, told me I was the worst singer he had ever heard, called me pathetic, told me that if the Agora kept booking bands with singers like me, he was just going to go somewhere else. Well, after he walked off, I was standing there stunned with a WTF look on my face. And the bartender who witnessed the whole thing, I remember he looked at me and said, Hey, kid, you got to shag it off. Not everybody liked Elvis. And I can promise you, not everybody's going to like you. All right, we got a great show tonight. I've got guitarist Johnny Scales here. We'll be right back. We're going to have a drink here, and okay. we're going we're gonna to toast the show. Okay. Is that okay with you? That's that's fine. Is with that me. okay with you, Al? Yeah, okay. Al over here, engineering man. He's doing. Yeah, he's, he's doing props for Al. He's, he's been a, making it making it look right his, all night. Super tonight. job, and I couldn't yes, afford indeed. the Jack Daniels, so we're gonna have to go with the other one. There's your little hero. Oh, I appreciate that. That's no problem. That is no <laughs> problem. That's a, mighty, that's a mighty good pour you got there, my friend. Well, it's a big drink because it's going to be a big show. I mean, I, that, that, that's all I can tell you. So let's have a little toast here to the Chris Massey Show. Here we go. Bottoms up, my friend. Mm. Uh, oh, good Lord. Show's over, folks. <laughs> Just make sure I get my rice aroni. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. Oh. oh, my God. Johnny, you know he's not supposed to be drinking. Chris, Chris, wake up. you got to finish the show. Where am I? Web TV. All right. You just saw a skit from the very first episode of the Chris Massey Music Show, uh, 51 episodes ago, back in April of 2014. And the gentleman that was in that uh, skit with me was the one and only Mr. Uh, Johnny Scales. And he's my guest tonight. Would you please welcome to the Chris Massey Music Show, Mr. Johnny Scales. Come on in, brother. I'm good, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Have a seat. All right. So you remember that, you know, that skit that night with the... <laughs> no, we were drinking. <laughs> Yeah, we got Al's green screen all wet that night, and uh, he didn't appreciate that much. But anyway, um, now Johnny, uh, since you have uh, last been on the show, mm -hmm. I have noticed because I'm friends with you on Facebook that you uh, are known to Johnny Scales to a lot of people that have known you a long time. Right. But you are also known uh, by another uh, another name, an appellation. If yes, you and the it is J M F. Scales, and I will tell yeah. you that the MF does not stand for Mother's Finest. No, in, in the middle there. No, and um, uh, so how did that come about? And um, it seems to be working working real well for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it was given to me uh, by a gentleman named Jamie Hood. Jamie Hood, and he coined it one day, and uh, I unfortunately accepted it, and it's. Uh, it's grown like a like crabgrass. Yeah, you got your own logo. It's on it's on some of the picks mm -hmm. that, that that you play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I I just snicker every time uh, every time I hear somebody say it. Well, so. Yeah. so what is uh so what has been going on with you uh with you musically? I know uh, the last show that I was associated with you was the uh, Tuckerville Pop Festival mm -hmm. back in twenty. Uh, Fifteen. Yes. And uh, you were with the Squirrel Heads. Yes. And you did a little work with Ralph Roddenberry that night mm -hmm. when we played that gig, and it was a really fun time. But uh, what's been going on since then? Uh, just this and that, playing around with different people. Right now, I'm in a state of holiday slowdown. Holiday slowdown. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, I've got uh, about twelve original songs. Okay. And uh, did you write all these songs? Yes. Very good. Very and much good. Much like. Uh, when you and I did our first record, mm -hmm. uh, got a little set up, and I'm doing the scratch oh, okay. tracks and the vocals, mm -hmm. get, like uh, getting my story down on paper. Right. And uh, that's just basically what I've been doing. Okay. Yeah. Now, I plan on going into the studio at the end of this year mm -hmm. to uh, record uh, record number four. 
And this time, I'm going to be uh, taking a band into the studio. Now, I did not do that last time. I used uh, session players, wrote a lot of the songs. Well, I had them, but we basically put them together in the studio. Uh, some of the songs on the Tuckerville have never been played live before. Right. You know, we made them. And it, it was a lot of fun, and it, it certainly opened up a lot more uh, creativity. But, uh, you know, I... I uh, I missed uh, bringing, bringing, bringing a band in there. You know, uh, there's something about it, you know, and uh, and I'm looking forward to doing it that way again. And I imagine that that's the way you'll cut yours when you get into the studio, right? If you've got the right band, mm -hmm. it's it's a great thing. You yeah. create something nice. If you've got the wrong band, yeah. you do take after that's right. take after take. Well, and you got to know the songs uh, backwards, forwards, mm -hmm. sideways, mm -hmm. and all that. You know, and and, and uh, one of the things that I was talking with Daniel Glozer, my guitar player, about is the uh, the thing in the studio now, pretty much, is uh, when guitar players go in there to cut the lead. You know, they put the loop on and they uh, and they and they do I don't know twelve, thirteen, fourteen Passes, takes. Right. They're all different. Right. All, all, all searching for something. Mm -hmm. Now, back in the old days, you could do as many takes as you wanted, but you lost the take before the one you were doing. You were not able to keep it. Right. And I saw this in a film, and I found this fascinating. Is is that when Leonard Skinner cut Freebird, mm -hmm. that long guitar solo by Alan Collins in the mm -hmm. end, there was no improvising in that lead. That is the way they did it live. That is the way they had done it for years. Mm -hmm. He played it note for note for note every time he played the song. Right. That was the way it was played. Yep. So that was not had. So you didn't have to come up with that in the studio. And that's what I'm looking to do this time right. is to go in there and and everybody know their part. And I'm not sure. going in there to look for a guitar lead because we already got it. Right. It's in the song. Guitar players played it. 50, 60 times, right. and we'll do uh, several takes to get the best one. Right. But it won't be different. Right. They'll, 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 they'll all be the same. Right. You know. Sure. So, and I think that's the way that you, uh, you you like to look at it too. Yes, pretty much. Yeah, because I mean the song. I mean a lot of the a lot of songs. You know, the lead is such a, a such a big part. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 it's got to be written and um and arranged and everything just just like just like the rest of the songs are. You know, like uh. That guitar lead and, uh, and reeling in the years, mm -hmm. you know, that makes the tune. You oh, know, yeah. w w w without a doubt, that, that that's one of the best part. Of Hotel California is another one. Right, is, is another one. Like other songs, you know, you know, a lot, especially pop songs, the guitar lead really doesn't stand out that much. You know, it's more about the melody and the lyrics. But in rock music, especially, it plays it plays such a big part. Now I know when we went in and recorded, um, especially the first record. Mm -hmm. I know you had all the leads were all pretty much were all right. ready to go. Right. And the second for the most part. Mm -hmm. For the most part. I remember we, we messed around with, with a few different things. But um uh, you know the thing about experimenting in the studio is that it's too expensive. Well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well thing think about Leonard Skinner, they played together for a long time. That's they were right. a family. That's and, right. You know, it's kinda hard to get that relentless rehearsal. Yes. Yeah, it's hard to get that kind of a situation together in in the world we live in mm -hmm. it is um but yeah generally when it comes to the solo thing uh, in that type of music i don't want it exact note for note worked out but i want to have the stepping stones there right right i got you you got a beginning you got an end and you've got somewhere to go in between in between exactly you know and i read what somewhere where that uh rem when they would cut the rhythm tracks for their records mm -hmm. they didn't even use a scratch vocal track you know that, 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 that that's how well they knew it. Right. You know they just went in there and Bill Berry counted it off and 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 they just played the song with no with no vocals whatsoever. Played it through and then Michael Stipe would come right. in and come in and do the singing. Right. And uh and you don't find that hardly at all. No. No. <laughs> guy nope. guys that know that that know the tune that know the tune that well and stuff. So, well, I uh, I viewed a uh, video today that talked about when the Stones went down to R Muscle Shoals. Okay, recorded stuff for Sticky Fingers. Right, mm -hmm. and the songs they recorded, uh, I think uh, Keith had Wild Horses. It was like a um, a little nursery rhyme kind of a thing that he was writing for his son. Mm -hmm. Horse, and Mick took and wrote lyrics to fill that out. Right. But Brown Sugar, um, they came up with the, the tune, and basically uh, Keith would sing along with it, but there wouldn't be words. It'd be just... 
guttural well, yeah, A's, yo, you, whatever. Coming up with a melody. To get an yeah. idea. And Mick would listen to it. Start writing. Mm-hmm. And they would basically play the song until they got a good enough take, and then they stop. <laughs> right. Now, you know, in Keith Richards' book, he says that Mick Jagger is the one that came up with that guitar riff for the beginning of Brown Sugar. Oh, really? Yeah, he, hmm. he sure did. He said that Mick's the one that came up with the dun-dun, you know, at the, hmm. at, the, at the beginning of the tune. Okay. I also saw a thing with Jimmy Page when he was talking about uh, Stairway to Heaven. Right. That he had written that thing musically. Right. And when Robert Plant got ready to write the lyrics to it, he wasn't changing the music. Right. He wasn't changing it at all. He was going to have to make it work where the changes were and, and, and this and that and the other. Which I found, which I found fascinating. Right. You know, and uh, and and you know, it, the the music comes together with the lyrics and the melody, and it's all a beautiful thing when it works together, and sure. and and everybody likes it and stuff. So, um, so you're not in a band right now, is that right? I'm in uh, several that aren't really doing anything right now. I got you. I got so, you. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. So you get asked to sit in quite a bit, though, I'd imagine, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 yeah I'm uh. uh Looking for some folks to put together another little blues thing because I've been out of that for a while and that's fun. Right, right. And then I'm doing this little thing where I'm writing some music and uh, just kind of in between things. I'm sure it'll yeah. pick back up. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know at our age finding guys that that want to play, you know. And I was talking with uh, somebody today and we were talking about uh, you know they said well you know we're in a band but everybody's too busy. Well here's the deal, if you're too busy. You need to be in a band where everybody's too busy. <laughs> right, right. That's what. That's what you. That's the band you need to play in. Okay, because yeah. if you're too busy and you've got guys that aren't too busy, it is not going to work. I don't care how good you are. Right. I, I, I mean, I mean, it's just not. You know, like the new band I've got now. You know, I told them I said, look, guys, you know, I need you to commit to one night a week till we get everything down, and, and then when we get everything down, you know, the only time we're going to really get together is to learn new material. Right. You know, and, and and if you can't do that, well, then we can't do it. Right. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's that simple, you know. But, you know, uh, it's been my experience that older older people get, you know, well, I don't want to do gigs on this certain night. Right. And and that's too far to drive. Right. And, um, and you know, for me, you know, um, I would rather be playing music than just about anything. Right. I'd damn sure rather be doing it than sitting on my couch. Right. You know, and... Um, uh, you know, I don't care if I got to drive. Daryl Rhodes told me one time, he said, I don't care if I got to drive 80 miles and you're paying me $150. What matters is, is I'm playing drums. Right. I'm not sitting at home watching <laughs> Daryl's a lot older something. than me. Right. You know, and, uh, and, yeah. and, I, and, I agree, and I agree with that 100 times. You yeah. know, the, and the older you get, you realize is that the opportunities to perform music. You know, we all play our last show. Right. You know, and, and, and probably most of us aren't going to know when that is. Nope. You, you know. So uh, to turn to turn down an opportunity, it's hard for me to do that. Right. Hard, hard, hard for me to turn down. I mean, it's really got to be a bad situation for right. uh, for something like that to happen. So in May, you are going to be doing some shows with me. Yes. We're going to be going uh, May the fifth. We're going to be either in Tifton, Georgia, at the Bistro, or a new club in Savannah. And I think that Saturday they're working on us a gig at the 747 Lounge in Jacksonville. All right. Which is near the airport. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you wouldn't have guessed. And then Ooh. Sunday afternoon we're going to be playing at Skipper's Smokehouse in Tampa, Florida. And you're going to love this place, man. It's it's a club, and they've got like a built-in amphitheater inside the club. Oh, wow. You, you walk out of the restaurant, and there's a stage, and it's outdoor, and it's kind of thing. And uh, they do these things on Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock. And we're going to be playing with a band that is really big in Central Florida called the Soul Circus Cowboys. Uh, they're friends of ours. Uh, we kind of swap gigs. They're going to be up here doing a gig at the Moon Shadow. Right. That I was able to work for them, and, and they worked us a gig down there. And uh, they got they got a lot of good things going on there. So I think Excellent. it'll be it'll be a... It'll be a good time. Yeah. It, it'll, it'll be a good be a, time. It'll be fun. So how long has it been since you slept on a Motel 6? <laughs> <laughs> a long time. You know, Motel 6 is the uh, motel sponsor for the Chris Massey Band. We have stayed in Motel 6s as far north as Hartford, Connecticut, Hollywood, California, and places like Wichita, Kansas. And um, it's uh, most of the time it's a good experience. Well, we'll have to get a video of you uh, throwing a smartphone out of a window or something. <laughs> Well, 
You know, the thing is with Motel 6 is, is they've done this nationwide renovation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get one that's renovated, mm -hmm. you get one that's got the fake hardwood floor in it. Okay. It's got a uh, about a 42-inch flat-screen TV mounted on the wall. Okay. New furniture, and it's painted kind of a mod orange and white color. Okay. Half circular shower, really cool. Uh, when we were in Denver... We got one that was not renovated, and okay. the carpet had been in there since nineteen since it was six dollars a night. Oh, okay. that, that, that's what I'd be willing to bet, and it was horrible. That's why they leave the light on. Stunk bad. I mean, it was. It was. You know, we were only there to sleep, but it, but it was bad. But if you get one that's renovated, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's not too bad of a deal, okay. you know. And you know, when you when you're when you're making the big bucks like I am out there on the road, you know, you got to uh, you got to cut corners uh, everywhere you can, every, <laughs> everywhere you can. So what are you doing? Uh, What's uh, what is Plan A these days for you? What what have you been doing? Uh, audio visual installations. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I've been doing that, and I still do a little remodeling. And okay, uh, so you're still you're, you're like an independent contractor for for this? Yes. Okay, so you're kind of your own boss to mm, an extent. Well, no, I mean uh, you're never your own boss. If well, that's somebody's true. paying you money. Well, yeah, somebody's that, the boss. That is true. That is true. Um, so. Uh, no, so I don't ever look at it that way. That's right. Uh, well, but I mean, you can. I'm a subcontractor. Let's put go. it that way. And subcontractors can uh, can finagle the day off without getting permission. Oh yes, yes. That's the difference. Well, yeah. I mean, I just let him know. <laughs> that, that, I don't have that, to have that, permission. That's the difference. When you work for a company, I mean, you know, and they tell you you get this many days vacation. Right. This many sick days, right. this many personal the rest days. Of the time you're I there. mean, I mean, you can just feel the chains tightening up around your neck. Oh, you, yeah. you know, they own you, and uh, oh, yeah. and that's the way it's going to be. And then what's funny is though is that I take less time off since I've had my own business. And I had the corporate job before I went into the gutter business. I was getting a three weeks paid vacation. I've been there long enough to accumulate that. Had right. ten paid holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never come close to taking that many days off. Right. <laughs> you, know, right. you know, since that time. Well, so what so what kind of guitar are you playing now? You still got the, uh, the one that was uh, made for you that you used yeah, to play with me? I'm playing Telecasters mostly. Telecasters. Okay. And I did some Christmas. That'll work real well with what we're doing. Yeah, I did some Christmas shows, so I pulled that uh, that DR Mine that's kind of like a Gretsch guitar. Right. I uh, mm -hmm. pulled that out of the mothballs for that because we were doing like some Brian Setzer and okay. some, you know, big band swingy kind of. Right. Uh, arrangement so i pulled that one out of the mothball but mainly i've been playing telecasters telecaster is a good basic guitar mm -hmm. and if you can't make one of them sound good wiggle sticks and knobs <laughs> and buttons ain't gonna help you that's right that's right so that, that's yeah. right yeah, yeah that tele sound that tele sound is sweet you know i was watching the uh the uh the movie uh ladies and gentlemen here of the rolling stones which is the film of the 1972 United States tour. Right. And this is when you wanted to see the Stones. It was the uh, Exile on Main Street tour. Mick Taylor. Mick Taylor. MPEG amplifiers. Yes, absolutely. And every clip, and they show them from all over the country where they're playing, every clip, Keith is playing a Telecaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mick is either playing a Les Paul or an SG. Mm -hmm. And that Gibson Fender sound mm -hmm. that they got. That's it. I mean, I mean that, that was just... You know, I don't know, uh, you know, when he left the band, when Mick Taylor left the band, I always wondered, I always felt like they took a step backward getting Ron Wood. Well, I don't think they took a step backward. I think they took a step sideways because he's actually a good player. That's true. And he does a lot of stuff you don't really notice. That's right. And he's more of a uh, a team player kind of guy. Yeah, like Brian Jones was. Mick and, Taylor and was the hot shot guitar player. Right. Guy. Well, in Keith's book, he said that when Mick was in the band, that they literally had a rhythm guitar player and a lead guitar mm -hmm. player. And that's the only period when they did. Right. Now, I don't know what it is, but, I mean, the albums he played on are the absolute best, mm -hmm. in, in, in my opinion. Sure. You know, but like all, uh, uh, like any band... You know, sooner or later, the stuff's going to keep, uh, it's going to quit coming. But see, that was also part, I mean, that was during the time when uh, Keith was switching over to his five-string open G tuning that right. came to dominate all the stuff after that. That's true. So That's true. that was, you know, you got to look at it, that's part and parcel to what was going on there, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, when they were getting ready to record uh, Exile. Right. He had talked to one of the Everly brothers and asked about, uh, maybe it was Bye Bye Love. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that guitar is not in standard tuning. 
it's tuned like a banjo. Five strings, open G. And there's Chet Atkins playing on that track, too. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what they used to do a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of guitar players uh, in their 20s and things like that switched over to banjo because, I mean, switched over to guitar from banjo because banjo went out of Dixieland and all that went out of favor. Well, I heard in the, make money. in the 1920s that sales for banjos in America were double what sales of guitars were. Right. But it started lower, you know. Right. Uh, before well, that, it, it was mandolin. Well, in that time too, um, uh, a guitar really wasn't a lead instrument. No, but, uh, I mean, I mean, it really Charlie wasn't. Christian changed all that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, in the big bands, it was more like a, ry a rhythm instrument, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but uh, but anyway, we'll, look, we're going to have a great time on the road trip. And yeah. uh, what we're going to do, John, is I'm going to invite you over to my new rehearsal space that I've got. And uh, me and you are gonna have a rehearsal, just the two of us, go sure. over the stuff, get it all ready. Sure. And uh, you're gonna you're gonna love playing with the guys. I know uh, Mike Cunningham. You know mm -hmm. he played played some bass with us back mm -hmm. in the Hellcats days. Yes. And I've got uh, Michael Wheeler who uh, played drums for Cindy Lou Harrington okay. for a number of years. Great okay. country player, of course. Um, and on uh, steel guitar, I have uh, Henry Bruns who played with uh, Daryl Rhodes and High Vision Orchestra and with a band called the Vidalias. Okay. They were a pretty big band in the '90s uh, okay. here, so uh, so it's going to be a good lineup, and we're and we're going to have a really good time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thanks for coming by, my friend. Thank you, Johnny Scales. Everybody, we'll be right back. Hey, I'm Leon Smoker, and I'm Rachel Jordan, and I'm Moses Mo from Mother's Finest, and you're watching the Chris Massey Music, Music Show. Show. Hey man, you remember that time when you guys opened for Aerosmith? I do. <laughs> man, man that, that was awesome. On the Chris Massey Music Show, Johnny Scales will receive a six-month supply of Rasaroni, the San Francisco treat, and a case of Turtle Wax, and a case of O'Doul's non-alcoholic beer. O'Doul's for those times in life when you only need to look like you're having a good time. All right. Okay, Al, so uh, we're going to do uh, 11 more shows in this season. Yes. We'll do, do a, uh, one a month. Mm -hmm. And um, so here are some things that we have got on the Chris Massey Music Show wish list for 2017. Uh, Michelle Malone. We're going to do everything in our power to try to get Michelle Malone on the show. Um, and uh, I know some people that know her. And uh, uh, I have never met Michelle. Okay. Always been a big fan, though. And hopefully we can get her on the show. Peter Stroud. Oh, okay. Peter Stroud, lead guitar player for Sheryl Crow, mm -hmm. also did a tour with Don Henley. Wow, uh, is is always around my hometown, Tucker and the Moonshadow Tavern sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna try. In fact, I talked to him. Uh, I sat in with Daryl Rhodes's band there uh, one night, and uh, Peter was playing, and uh, said he would love to do the show. It's wow. just a matter of uh, scheduling to uh, to get him in there. Uh, Daryl Rhodes will be back this year. Man. And sometime, Mr. Rhodes will be here to uh, talk about God knows what. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's uh, down in Mexico now. You know, to, he's like one of those to, Don Rickles guys. Just turn him loose. <laughs> he's, he's down in Mexico to the middle of the month. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he goes down there in, in vacations. Uh, nice. Quite a bit. Quite a bit, Daryl does. Right. So anyway, um, uh, that, that's pretty much we're going to be doing uh, what we always do here, talking a little politics, having some comedy, and having some great uh, musical guests. Uh, Saturday. January 21st, you can catch the Downtown Executives and the Chris Massey Band along with Steve Cullen at the Avondale Town Cinema. Um, I'm going to be debuting my brand new band, and we look forward to seeing you there. So, like I always say, I always love you, woman. Take life as it comes, and when you get the chance, have too much fun. We'll see you next time.